afternoon, everyone. Um, if you can, please be seated. We're going to begin the session in a, in a couple of minutes. I know people like to hang out at the back. I like to hang out at the back too, but if you want to take a seat, this is your opportunity to do so. We're running slightly behind, but we're, we're going to take the full 30 minutes um, to discuss this really important topic. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome you to the next half an hour where we'll be looking at the issue of climate emergency, humanitarian action, and gender equality. Um, I'm also aware that we've only got 30 minutes, so encouraging people to use the live stream and the Twitter to post comments because we're probably not going to have enough time to be able to take some comments from the floor, but maybe just having a couple of questions after um, the, the presentation. So um, without taking any more time, it's my great pleasure to welcome Suzanne Buckingham. She's a research and writer on gender and environmental justice, and the floor is yours then for the next 15 minutes or so. Thank you very much for inviting me to address this Congress. Um, I'm very aware that my research and work is in the global north, and that's where I'm drawing most of my examples from. So forgive me, but I'd also like to thank Derek, who I heard this morning, for her earlier inspiring talk, and which provides a really strong example um, in another place. I'm really honored to be able to present the case for gender equality to be a foundational consideration in how to address clim the climate crisis and its, hu its humanitarian responses. I've been asked to focus on the hopeful and the constructive, and I have chosen my examples and illustrations with this in mind. I can be a lot more critical. But I've also been given, given permission to be provocative, so there's a little scope there. What links gender, and, gender equality with the climate emergency and humanitarian action? I argue that it's dominant values, systems, and structures which embed gender inequality and misogyny. Yesterday, Jennifer Morgan has already referred to the capitalist system particularly its ne neoliberal variant. Whoops, I have to go to my notes now. Um, and I would add that that is highly masculinist, particularly the alpha, uber, or industrial masculinity which dominates political and business discourse and decision-making. It's climate skeptical, and it can be done by women. And just as men can and need to be differently masculine, as many, I think, and perhaps growing numbers are doing so. I want to use the first example. Whoops, where's my picture gone? Help. <laughs> I've got a blank slide. Yeah, but then there should be. I've lost time. picture. I've lost time. It's not okay. okay. Well, I did have a, some beautiful pictures on here, and they seem to have disappeared in the, tran in the transition. And my first picture was of the Chipko movement in the Himalaya. Established by a Himalayan community in India to protect the felling of the forest, particularly for mining. The, the forest was being deforested for mining. Women were the mainstay of the action because deforestation destroys subsistence and livelihoods, and women were the main subsistence farmers and small market traders. Water sources dried up. Women walked to collect water daily, and these journeys increased in length. Deforestation creates unstable slopes and increased water runoff when it rains, and this increased the risk of flooding which had a particular impact on women who are more vulnerable to drowning, as the Bangladesh floods in 1991 dramatically demonstrated. 
Neve Moore writes about women in Canada who adopted a grandmother persona to protest the clear-cut felling of the British Columbian forest, also for a mine. They're a branch of the Canadian raging grannies, concerned about the health of their collective children and grandchildren. Not all were grandmas, not all were even mothers. Interviews reveal many reasons for their involvement, increasing, including experiences of misogyny and sexual abuse, which for one woman at least, ignited a concern with how the land was being abused. She recognized the woods as her escape and a place of healing. Sexual abuse and other forms of violence are an indirect result of climate crisis. Abuse of women and girls in refugee camps and shelters, from New Orleans to Darfur, where flooding and drought have forced temporary and permanent migrations. Margaret Aston's work in Australia reports increases in domestic violence in and directly after bushfires. There's also in the ether a lovely picture of the fracking nanas in Lancashire who wear yellow t-shirts. They protest, protest quadrilla's exploratory frac fracking, concerned about their families and com communities, but also global health. All of these protests emerge from women's own subordinate position in society as carers, unpaid and low paid. In low paid jobs, worldwide, women always represent a majority of people in poverty, as subsistence farmers and as victims of social and domestic violence, again, always more women than men. This exposes them to direct impacts of climate change, whether through living in the most vulnerable areas to flooding. It was notable, for example, that it was African-American women-headed households most affected by Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, or being less able to swim. In Bangladesh and Pakistan, um, women are much less able to swim than men, or being more vulnerable to heat waves. This is unexplained but women were disproportionately highly impacted in the French heat wave in 2003. We need to listen to these women, but these women's voices are the less heard. Members of parliament, CEOs of organizations from energy companies to NGOs, senior civil servants, all are more likely to be men. And where women are involved, they don't always represent the experiences women have of the direct and indirect violence of climate crisis, or the inefficiencies, or worse, of humanitarian action. In the UK, the Charities Commission has recently reported its investigations of inappropriate and possibly illegal sexual behaviour of some of their senior male staff. The UN Security Council and NATO have produced guidelines in the early 2000s on why it's important to have women's involvement in peacekeeping, and that's women's involvement from the grassroots. In 1992, the UN Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro, and in 1995, the Beijing Platform for Action on Women also stressed the importance of women's involvement and environmental action. But 30 years later, we are a long way from achieving real and meaningful representation. If only we had listened to these women, who again are not now pictured on this slide. <laughs> One of them is a 19th century, I'd say amateur scientist, Eunice Foote. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of her. I hadn't heard of her until I was researching my book this year. She identified the greenhouse gas several years before John Tyndall, who is officially recognized as doing so. Her husband was allowed to present her paper at a Smithsonian Institute conference in the US, but her paper never made it into formal print. Seven Color Suzuki, is a long-time First Nation Canadian intergenerational justice um, campaigner. Seven and Friends founded the Environmental Children's Organization when they were nine years old. 
This culminated in her speech to the UN at the Rio summit in 1992, when she was 12. Again, if we'd listened to her then, perhaps Greta Thunberg's job wouldn't be so difficult now. And of course, Greta and many colleagues. Women are at the forefront of challenging environmental damage and demanding action on, climate in, on the climate emergency. My local paper, some of you may know, The Guardian, ran a feature earlier this week on MPs who voted for climate change, climate crisis related action. In the UK, women comprise now 32% of all MPs. But of the 100% of MPs voting to respond to the climate crisis, 47% were women. Anne Hidalgo, mayor of Paris, is one of five women European mayors in the nine large cities introducing car-free centers. This is a disproportionately high impact for women. Caroline Lucas is the only Green, um, UK's Green Party MP and campaigns tirelessly on green and social justice issues. I had included a photo of her opposing fracking in southern England. She was arrested for this. Rebecca Long Bailey in the UK and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez in the US are shaping and promoting a socially and environmentally just Green New Deal. At some cost to themselves from misogynist and in Alexandra's case, racist critics. And however much we may criticize the Paris Agreement it was Christiana Figueres who salvaged some kind of deal after the failure of Copenhagen in 2009. And under her stewardship, gender equality targets were at least and at last introduced for negotiators and decision makers in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. 16 years after the Beijing Platform for Action on Women and 19 years after Agenda 21 did so. And our future depends on the support, respect, and recognition of the incredible young women challenging how our society addresses social and environmental emergencies. And I had chosen three women, uh, one of whom you would all recognize if you saw her, Greta Thunberg. But I had a picture of two of my neighbors, Ella and Soraya, who have been at the forefront of the school strike in my hometown, Cambridge, every Friday since last autumn. And Autumn Peltier, a 15-year-old native Canadian water activist, who in 2018 gave a presentation to the UN General Assembly, which ended, we need to join forces with all nations, regardless of color and nationality. Mother Earth does not discriminate, and we need Mother Earth to live, and we need the waters. When we stand together as one, we are one voice and one nation. And together as one, we are stronger. We have this one last chance to save our planet. Let's do this for our great grandchildren. So in 2014, Friends of the Earth identified 10 key themes which they thought they needed to address in the next 15 years or the following 15 years. One of these was gender equality and involving women equally. And the significance of this being Friends of the Earth, I feel is quite strong because for many years I've been involved with a UK, UK NGO, Women's Environmental Network. It was set up by women from Friends of the Earth who felt that they were not doing enough to further women's particular concerns. But in 2015 and again 2018, Friends of the Earth and C40 Cities, of which Mayor Hidalgo is currently the president, published a book, Why Women Will Save the Planet. Some of the women I've mentioned here, some who have written about the movements I've described, and some who I haven't had time to mention, make a collective good case for why women will save the planet. It's worth a read. The climate emergency will not be resolved by ignoring at best or denigrating at worst the half of the population that has generally shown the most enthusiasm and appetite for climate change while being most exposed. 
Women and men need to stand together as well as equals to fight social and climate injustice, equally valued and equally respected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm so much in that presentation, and I know how difficult it is when you're delivering something and the slides you've prepared don't quite come off, so, so much appreciated. Um, just a, a couple of, of questions, actually. I think um, perhaps a very obvious question, but one that might be worth you expanding a little bit more on, is what do you mean by gender equality, and what about the role of men in, in this? Thank you very much for that question. Um, there's never enough time to, to get everything into a short presentation. But I, I've been researching and writing on this for the last um, 30 years. And what is becoming increasingly to me, partly through more men colleagues actually writing on masculinities, is that there is a particular kind of masculinity which has created the problems that we see now, environmental, humanitarian, many other kinds of, of problems, um, financial problems. Um, and it does men a disservice as much as it does everybody else. And there is a particular kind of masculinity which is privileged. And if you want to get in, get on in particular organizations, um, then that is the kind of masculinity that is aspired to. And it applies to women as well as men. Um, there's some interesting work in Sweden looking at climate um, decision-making bodies in local government where the proportion of women is often 40%, approaching 50%. And the decisions are not that different but what the researchers are proposing is that the people who are involved, men and women, have come through the same training places, uh, mostly engineering and planning departments, which are quite male-dominated, and um, that it's not just the fact that we need more women in positions in power, we need a... Um, different kinds of masculinities and forms of femininity to be in power. And I can say that because I remember the Prime Minister of the UK in the 1980s and 90s. And she did women and gender equality a huge disservice, apart from some people telling me she was a good role model for girls and women. And so, yes, uh, we need more women and men who embrace more feminine attributes. So I'm, I'm just listening to what you're saying and reflecting on it and um, thinking about places and spaces where I might have influence. It's quite challenging to bring forward different approaches, even if you, you know, even as a woman. And I'm just wondering how what do these approaches look like? What does a more feminist approach look like without, this, without being essentialist? So what are you expecting women to do or more feminist mindsets to do when they get around the table? Um, I think one thing is just being able to draw from one's own experience. Um, and if everyone around a decision-making table has the same experience, then the decisions that are going to be made are very limited. If we can bring people together into decision-making who have very different experiences, and that part of that would depend on their gender, their sexuality, whether or not their parents, um, where they're from in the world, what their religion is, uh, what their family structures are like, and so on and so forth then we can start to be a lot more inventive. Um, and the crisis we're in needs an awful lot of inventiveness now to address. Okay, thank you. I think that was quite... What, I mean, just sort of talking about this issue of inventiveness and the aspirations of, of gender equality, they don't always appear to deliver 
as well for black women, for example. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Because that, for me, talks about power in that room as well. Yes, I'm, I'm very conscious of that as a white woman, a white, middle-aged, able, um, non-disabled woman. Um, there's a, a, a researcher in the US, Dorsita Taylor, who's looked at the environmental movement and environmental governance. Um, and she found very strikingly that whereas those organizations were beginning to promote women and hire women, they were almost exclusively white. And this represents a real problem. And we, organizations, and I've been involved in some environmental NGOs, and I think uh, I've, I've supervised PhDs on um, the gendering of environmental NGOs, and I, th I think we should be starting with our own houses, if you like. I, I think, certainly, I'm, I can't speak for humanitarian organizations, but definitely environmental organizations, they, um, I think they're still quite gendered. Uh, they are still predominantly white in the global north, for sure. And definitely, I think we should start there. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not we have got time to take a question for the audience. We have got time to take a question. Wonderful. So are there any questions from the audience then? I can't see if there are. No, oh, there is one. <laughs> yes, please, yes, do. My name is yeah. François Grunewald, I'm from, from Group uh, uh The person dealing with the environment in our team is a woman, so he's, he's very much taking into account what you said, and, and she's very sensi sensitive to that. We, we had a couple of weeks ago a uh, conference in our center on the issue of uh, collapse, collapsology, on the whole, if we push all those events to the last uh, uh, step of a uh, terrible disaster, we find that indeed, women would be the first one that would be a, a large part of the, of the brutality of collapse, whatever it takes place. So I think it's critical to ensure that we, uh, again, as we often say in our humanitarian uh, uh, programming to have gender, but to have to, to, to go maybe one step further uh, and to see how we can ensure that in all those deliberation and environment, indeed, women have a, a strong say because they will be uh, clearly uh, uh, one of the main stakeholders of the response and one of the main victims of the, of the disaster. So how do we ensure to do that? Uh, I think do, uh, my question would be to you. Do you think we uh, reach out enough with the uh, environmental studies that are taking place in universities to make sure that this gender component becomes a generic component of environmental studies? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Do you? Yeah. Um, thanks very much. I think we do all have a responsibility wherever we work um, and with all organizations that we're in touch with. I think we need to hold our politicians to account. I think we need to hold our organizations, whether it's um, companies that we do business with, whose products we buy, who's, um, who in invest whatever money we've got and so on and so forth. and press them to uh, be genuinely, uh, not just to respect women, but to, because it, it's, I suppose a feminist approach is not just to bring women to the same position as some of the privileged men, but it's actually to, rev is to look at real equality where everyone is valued equally. And we're so far from doing that. Um, I, I have very mixed, I'm sure with all of you as well, have very mixed feelings at the moment. Um, again, being British, this week is so traumatic with everything that's happening with Europe. But also this week, there's been a massive protest in London, uh, protesting the climate crisis, which has involved uh, probably 2,000 arrests by now, including my partner. Um, and there's enormous, that, that gives me hope that there's such a, an upsurge of um, 
activity which is peaceful, which is constructive, which is trying to be respectful of everyone equally, although Extinction Rebellion is not perfect and it has been criticized uh, for its um, perhaps disregard of race and, and ethnicity. But it's also that that has to be balanced by there are dark times and we need to take a stand somehow. And gender equality and race equality and uh, respecting people who are disabled and otherwise um, uh, they, have, they have no respect. Again, um, just reading about what's happened in, in Uganda or what's proposed in Uganda this week for same-sex couples, it's, I think we're, we've talked about tipping point for climate and I think this is really a tipping point for action and, and getting some political traction as well, but uh, challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that response. I mean, it's, it's good. I mean, one of the things that I'm hearing you say is that the, the feminism is not just about women. And that message is coming straight. I mean, when you said why women should save the planet, I thought, oh, just another thing we have to do. But I mean, I, th I, think, what you're, I think what you're saying is that actually we're looking at how we become involved in ways that can promote greater equity, but deliver more benefit for more people with more imagination, with different approaches, all of these things that, that people are definitely fighting for. Um, just one last question for me, from me, actually, because um, what I, I run a civil society organization, and the, I, the benchmark, the ideal for, for our organizations is really high. The work that we're doing, it, it's so important. But there's a, a slight crisis of confidence, and I wonder, you, you mentioned it briefly in, in your um, address, and I just wonder if you could just pick up what you think we ought to be doing as NGOs, as humanitarian organizations, any pe as people involved in this fight, to ensure that we can maintain the expectations, as high as they are, that, that people have of us. Um, somebody... I think maybe Jennifer Morgan mentioned yesterday, and I've heard it um, from some other talks, is the importance of working together. And the, the Women's Environmental Network, who I mentioned, um, that was set up in 1988, it has nearly fallen by the wayside several times because of lack of funding, but it had its 30th birthday party last year. And um, it works in partnership with a lot of other small groups, Pesticides Action Network, Real Nappies Campaign, um, food growing cooperatives and so on. And I think the only way for organizations is to work collaboratively. And it's not about the big NGOs absorbing or taking on the successful campaigns of the small ones either, because I've experienced that as a, as a trustee and chair of WEN. Um, there can be I don't want to tread on anyone's toes here, but amongst NGOs, it's a very competitive market. Everyone is looking for money to keep them afloat. Um, but we can't afford to be competitive. We have to work together. And then if we're not being competitive, we can afford to be constructive and work for those highest ideals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, oh, there's a question. Are you pointing at me? Yes. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, my name is Marius. I'm a student and I'm a male. Um, <laughs> so in these discussions, I'm sometimes getting increasingly frustrated by my own gender um, because it cannot be the sole solution to empower women to stand up on a stage and counter the, excuse me, bullshit fabricated in male-dominated power systems. But that, that cannot be the sole solution. It's not up to the woman to do this job alone. Um, what I'm, yeah, but. <laughs> what I would like to get some advice on is how to counter these traditional image of masculinity and how to get more male involved and like how to 
get Mayo to embrace this, as you said, enthusiasm for climate action. Okay. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah. And, and well, we've probably only got a few minutes. I could speak for hours on this. Um, and I, I'm involved in an EU project on marine research, um, which is specific, specifically looking at gender equality in marine research. Um, and they have a blog, and it's called Sharing the Caring. And I think one of the problems is, as a, soci a, soci a society, or dominant society, really devalues care. Housework is a drudge. Looking after children is not seen as, as prestigious as going to work in a well-paid, highly regarded job. And as long as we subscribe to those hierarchies, then the people who do the bulk of the caring um, are the least privileged in society. You, it was a bit like in the Soviet Union, um, there were plenty of women doctors. I think there was quite a good distribution of, of, of doctors, but actually the, the um, status of doctors wasn't so high as it was in so the West, as it was then called. And I think we need to change how we value things. And I think this denigration of care is reflected in how we treat the environment. And I think we need a whole kind of social revolution in, in revalue or in valuing care, in revaluing care. And it should be shared by everyone. Everyone should take their personal responsibility to clean the toilet, cook the dinner, provision the food, however. Um, and then to child rearing is the most important thing. I'm not a mother. Um, miraculously, I'm a grandmother. But I can see my grandchildren are the most important people because it, we're going to need them to help us out of the, the trouble we're in. Um, and if we don't care for them properly, and if men and women and everyone don't care for them properly, then we're in, we, we're role modeling it really badly. So thank you for that question. Okay, well, we're going to wrap up now. I, I think I, I've so enjoyed listening to you, and it's a shame that we didn't have a little bit more time, but um, we're going to go for lunch now, and um, thank you, Susan, for your fantastic presentation and for your comments. <laughs>